this program, you know, were always started during this time. And so I think it's very important for us to remember the tremendous uh, contribution made by it. Because uh, there seem to be some attempts to denigrate him. I think that is very important, very unfortunate. So it is important for us to cherish our leaders and their life. I think each succeeding leader should in fact cherish the memory of the previous people. If, if you try to dedicate those memories, I don't think it, it, it uh, improves your own status at all. In fact, it is better being somewhat narrow minded and somewhat. So, in any case, uh, whatever the government may or may not do, the one and the other will be in our hearts, you know. I will get. I was absolutely corresponding with it. And if anything has come out with the volume in my correspondence with the fact that he should take the trouble to write. I was 18 years old when I started the correspondence. And uh, it lasted for 17 years. And it's probably the time and energy that he took to write. But each one was better, by the way. It's my dear Kaiya. Kaiya was my pet name. Yeah. My father called him Kaiya. He did generation people. And uh, yeah. I remember I was in I was in Pastor Palace, Paris, I couldn't uh, in home very well. When he came to Jumbo for the first time, I, he met my father and left my little complaint to my father. My father. He looked, I wanted to meet Pandit Jindu. I grew up reading his books. In those school we read the discovery in India, we read the autobiography. Those were the books that inspired me as a young Indian wanted to get involved in politics. So next time he came, my father brought him a private. The time was a great admirer. This is my first time. And then of course, when I came back and when I came to 18, I became a region. And then right after his passing away, he was in very good. He was my mentor. He was my guru. And uh, I learned a great deal from him. Sitting with him and I joined him, listening to him talk, having breakfast with him in the morning, and seeing how he always said he must see everything in a historical perspective. He was a great historian also. He said he must look at things only at this point in time. He must look at them in a historical perspective. So, it was a great uh, privilege for me, as I said, uh, to be uh, associated as a Christian. Not as a colleague, but a Christian. Colleague, I was with him, I was with him. With him, I was with him. Just a disciple. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you, I doubt if there are more than half a dozen of you who are actually here in the freedom team. You have to wait over 75 minutes. Hmm. <clears throat> because people don't realize it is true that we attain our freedom through the extraordinary genius of Mahatma Gandhi, who is non violent and non violent, non cooperation and so on. So, but it also a fact that we paid the full price of freedom in blood and fear as a result of partition. Whenever people celebrate freedom, and it's worth celebrating after centuries of servitude, we must, uh, we must uh, remember the suffering that people went through. In partition, lakhs of people lost their lives. Millions were relocated in one of the greatest uh, migrations in, in world history. Garbars and Tokyo, there's nothing but the curse on their back. To say survive. And people must remember what it was like at that time. And I mean, go to say, I did not mean for Jamalwa Nehru and Sadar Vallabhai Patel, the Prime Minister and the Home Minister, Churchill's prediction about India may well have come to. As you know, Churchill said, India is no more country than the equator. When we leave, we break into 20 pieces. Those the people, not only those who they had a great team, but those were the two main people who held together the super state. 
is where the inspiration of my book uh, lies. Uh, it began sometime in 1946, uh, October, when the Indian Foreign Service became sort of good you know, roots, and then quickly evolved during the next two years, and finally, of course, over the next 10 years, approximately 401 or 404 Indian officials who are recruited and hired from all walks of life. And from not having any foreign service, what is named, in 10 years' time, we had a full-fledged Indian foreign service for the first time in the history of it. And what's most fascinating is that uh, the decision and the implementation was taken at, in, a, in a way uh, which did not really say much about the overarching vision, but some sort of a progressive, uh, progressive commitment you know, to have some a kind of a dedicated wing or a branch of uh, foreign service for the Indian state, which took charge in 1947 August. Um, it is actually around that time that all these people came in, and they, were, they came in from various walks of life, for example, they were the ICS officers who were the veterans, and then there were the, the new uh, recruits for the you know, competition dwellers, as they were called at the time. And that part, they were also the irregulars who came like the princes and, and uh, you know, the rebels and fighters who had fought the British forces, including uh, the comrades of Netaji Subhash and the Bose. So all these people came in at a time and created a service which more or less uh, began in the 19, late 1940s and the early 1950s, but then they covered the historical sweep of the early 20th century till the 21st century, because many of these people, including the ones that Sir mentioned just now, actually continue to serve in the government, uh, like for example, Mr. Rajesh uh, Mishra, uh, K. Lakhwar Singh, and Chinmaya Garek Khan. They all were in public life till around 2009 and 2010. Uh, I mean, uh, Rajesh Mishra passed away a little bit after that. Uh, but then overall, these individuals who, who we actually could see from the first page of the history of services were like, KPS Menon Senior and R.K. Nehru, as well as Subhi Malbat, Rajeshwar Dayal, and many others, to the very young recruits like uh, Meera Isha Daswani, whose daughter, Namita Sinha, is with us here. And then we have uh, Indira Kamtekar, a historian, whose father, Dilip Kamtekar, was also one of the direct recruits, the early recruits uh, in the Indian Foreign Service. So um, all these people came in and they created this service which then continued to work for the next few decades. So this entire historic sweep around 90 odd years is, uh, it was a very fascinating period of Indian diplomatic history and Indian diplomacy. So I felt when I looked at the directory, I felt that it was not just a directory full of names and career details, but a directory full of life and full of uh, interesting events and characters and, and you know, developments that need to be chronicled. And that is how the research into the book began. And all my interviews and all the you know, activities that went through during the very difficult period of the pandemic, um, I simply couldn't have done this without the brilliant team from HarperCollins. Uh, my editor, Swati Chopra, and also Anju Christine, they were very, very helpful during the last three years. And uh, they helped me to deal with the, the process of editing and etc. But then the research itself was very interesting and a great learning process because I got the rare support of three of the, or rather four of the direct recruits, uh, like Mr. K. Nadwar Singh, Eric Gonzalez, uh, Maharaja Krishna Gotra, and of course Mr. Chinmay Direct Khan, who now lives in New York. And uh, these individuals, uh, they not only inspired me and motivated me, but also uh, gave me the overarching focus, which is necessary to, to remember the rich origins of the Indian Foreign Service. I hope that uh, those of you who are here will, uh, will go around and talk about this book more, and so that uh, the, the legacy that lives on even today uh, is taken further. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Now we invite Professor Agrawal.
some sketches and some uh, impressions of the life of diplomats presents before us a picture of the making of significant part of Indian history, <coughs> that is Indian foreign service. I am not an expert on foreign affairs. I have never been journalist in my life. And uh, I have never been a student of Indian foreign studies. At the JNU, where Professor was Chancellor, I was not a student of Indian foreign studies. But I have been interested in Nehru for quite some time. And that is the only reason that I have been invited here and I have agreed to come. And therefore, I would just like to point out as deeply as possible <coughs> two basic points towards which this book directly takes our attention and which we should keep in mind while reading this book or while assessing them in any aspect of its policy and its acts. <clears throat> the Heru was obviously the product of national movement for Indian freedom, which was, if not unique, then very special at least in two ways. Our national movement was not only for political freedom, it also had a very strong component of self criticism It was not critical only of British imperialism and exploitation associated with it, it was, for example, very critical of Indian traditions and practices themselves, for example, in matters of past prejudices, communal tensions, and other, many other things. Let us not forget that for Gandhiji and his colleagues like Sardar Patel and Jawaharlal Nehru, the so-called Rachnatma Karikram or constructive program was as much a part of politics as one the education. So this part, this I describe as self-critical component of Indian freedom. Second was, and in this sense Nehru I think was the most suited person to be the first Prime Minister of India. I think amongst all our leaders, he realized very deeply the gist of Indian terms. And that is looking for enlightened middle way and discarding the very natural temptation of education. Extremes are very tempting. In our youth, we all want to burn the unjust social order or to destroy whatever we dislike. We all want a fresh beginning. But the experience of life teaches us that there cannot be a fresh beginning without any continuity. And Indian tradition and culture has been remarkable in the sense because of its special historical experience that here, the consensus ultimately has been on the golden middle path. Samyak is not just a word used by Buddha, but Samyak is a kind of gist of Indian way of looking at things. And Nehru, it's important for us to realize that Nehru tried to implement this in domestic as well as in foreign policy. And that is why in domestic policy also he was criticized for domestic economy. He was criticized by some for not being nationalist enough, or by some for not being revolutionary enough, by some for not being traditionalist enough, or by some for not being modernist enough. This was this understanding of India's uniqueness and the legacy of Indian <coughs> movement that I think went into the thinking of foreign affairs so far as well. The second important aspect of our national movement was a consciousness of the international environment right from the beginning. I mean, I am not very supportive of attaching the Khilafat movement with independence. I criticize that decision of Gandhi and other people. I do not like that decision. But the fact remains that right since 1920, Indian national movement, in some way or the other, saw itself as part of a larger global process. Larger global process of decolonization, fight against imperialism. It started from Khilafat's the Sixth Conference, then the activities in Jakarta, which are known as detailed in this book. So, this fact that Indian freedom cannot be 
and if you buy it itself, it has to be a part of a global process. And this is something which Nehru put very eloquently and categorically at the end of uh, by concluding this discovery of India in 1946 that India has a destiny, India has a role to play in the world again. And this role cannot be just a role on the market. India has to play a leading role in its own way. And that is why the kind of foreign policy he was imagining would not have been possible without a very conscious attempt of mentioning the continuity in some way or the other with the past. At the same time, the innovations were also required. Therefore, you had these ICS officers working as diplomats, but at the same time, you had journalists, radio persons, academics joining or being invited to join the Ministry of External Affairs. And it was through one encounter with such a person that in a subconscious way, the entire concern of Nehru comes out in the place. Kallur has mentioned Bachchan, Arivan Sai Bachchan, the eminent Hindi poet who was invited by Nehru to join the Ministry of External Affairs as not executive translator but as in charge of uh, making uh, the official language work or the work of Hindi more systematic and proper in the village and Bachchan was working in that capacity. So once Bachchan was asked to translate the president's speech in Hindi, if the president was supposed to deliver in English, Dana Patel was president and vice president Jatav Hussain was supposed to read out the Hindi translation. That is the practice which continues till today. So Bachchan translated that speech and Nehru was furious as Kallur writes that it was first opportunity for Bachchan to encounter the Kuna and we attacked them. Nehru got very angry with that process. Reason being that Bachchan had translated rightly so in a proper literary way, not in that Sakari Hindu which we want to talk about. Proper literary way. Nehru's point was that Jatav Hussain cannot pronounce this kind of thing. And it will be a scandalous situation that the Vice President of the Republic is not able to read a speech in national language or official language of Nigeria properly to the House of Parliament. Therefore, this translation has to be changed. But Chen had his own point. He was speaking from the point of view of integrity of language, not compromising the basic character of Hindi language and all that. But Nehru was insistent and it was in this context that he uttered a sentence which Kallur has quoted obviously from some, I, I think it is quoted from Bachchan Sahu No, I, I, I just want to read it as it is. So, Nehru told Bachchan, while Bachchan was arguing that to Jatav Hussain to do this, he can practice for a while, somebody can help him practicing to properly speak this or to read out this literary Hindi. Nehru lost patience. And he told Bachchan, you see, there is enough trouble in the country also. Don't act with that. Don't force Jatav Hussain to read a speech which he might not read properly and then invite kind of criticism, sarcasm, or religion or whatever. The point which I draw from this simple anecdote that the man constantly had the consciousness of India having a lot of troubles in every sphere of life. I mean, ordinarily speaking, it is a simple matter. A translation has to be read by the vice president, a translation has been done, the vice president will read. But Nehru was conscious of the fact that with this particular vice president, had there been Gopal Sambu part of performance that we had Dr. Karl Singh, Nehru would not have bothered him. But this, this particular translation has to be read out by Jacques. Mm -hmm. This cannot be done. So, you must realize that there is enough trouble in the country. I think Dr. Sambu mentioned about the delegation of Nehru to a bad mountain about Nehru. I can only, I just want to say one thing that unfortunately, we have traveled a lot, we have went down the road when the leaders in the country are not bothered about solving the troubles but probably adding to them. That has been the greatest tragedy of Indian democracy, I think, since we that happened. In such a context, the publication of this book, which is 
apparently about a particular part of the administration, that is diplomats, foreign service. But the book also gives us a lot of insight into the way Nehru looked at birth and also at to his diet and governance. Thank you, Balut. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Akhwar. May I now invite Mani Shankar Aya.
I too have heard good reports of Manisha Garaya. He may be taken into the Indian Foreign Service and sent to Masuri for his training. Signed, Jawaharlal Nehru, 23rd October, 20, uh, what's it, 1964, 63. So that is how I became the last recruit into the Foreign Service. And since I was the last recruit, it's hardly surprising that I do not figure in Kalu's book. <laughs> this is a very reverential book. It treats our first recruits with a great deal of respect, a great deal of honor, a certain amount of awe. But that's because he has the advantage, the author, of looking at people who are long dead. It was the fate of the second generation of Foreign Service officers that included me to have to serve under Nehru's first recruits. And there were at least two or three names here which I read in dread. <laughs> the only comfort I got from that was that in Senegal magazine in the early 80s, there was an excellent line, which I think Kalol should have incorporated in the book. The writer in Seminar Magazine said that the Foreign Service was, in, was initially constituted <coughs> by dispossessed princelings, illiterate cavalrymen, and well-connected initiates. <laughs> Anybody of my generation <laughs> could name to you which officers fell in which of these two. <laughs> and many of these people he treats with a reverence which I find extremely difficult to follow. One of them who's mentioned here, and maybe I shouldn't mention his name, was my ambassador in Baghdad. And Palol talks of him in terms which made me hardly recognize this man. <laughs> because my first quarrel with him when he came to Baghdad as my ambassador was when he invited me in great pride to attend a dinner party in his home where he was getting the wife of some prominent Iraqi politician as his chief guest. And he talked to her in terms that were as reverential as Kalor talks of this gentleman. So I went to the dinner and I found myself seated at a large circular brass table. And this lady was immediately opposite me. But across the entire diameter of the brass table, which was at least two arms long, so she reached for a bowl of cash nuts. And I, being a trained foreign service officer, immediately reached for that bowl to pick it up and give it to her. But the ambassador was quicker on the draw than I was. <laughs> so his hand reached the bowl before my hand did. <laughs> and he picked up the bowl and he gave it to the lady, who gratefully accepted the cash amounts. And I retired defeated. <laughs> but about four months later, this gentleman says to me, how dare you? You made me serve the cashew nuts in the lady. So I said, well, sir, I, I tried to get there, but you were quicker than me. <laughs> and he said, that is not acceptable to me. And he went on to write an annual confidential report on me which had an adverse comment in every single column except for the date of birth. I wasn't able to write an adverse comment on my date of birth. <laughs> so, so this character's ACR was then not shown to me, which it should have been. It was simply sent to the Ministry of External Affairs, where the Foreign Secretary, who was also mentioned in the book, a wonderful man called Ram Sati, 
gave it to another wonderful man called Ramesh Bhandari. And Ramesh Bhandari recommended that this gentleman, who is talked of in the highest terms by Kalod, that it should be burnt. So there's no copy of that left. But the copy of my reply I have with me. And so I've been able to refer to it. So there are very curious characters who are here, including another ambassador whom he doesn't mention, but belongs to your fraternity. He was a very, very famous journalist. And Indira Gandhi decided to send him to Hanoi as our uh, ambassador to Hanoi. Except that she didn't have the guts to call him the ambassador because the United States had passed the Battle Act. And under the Battle Act, any country having diplomatic relations with North Vietnam was going to be sanctioned. And we were living ship to mouth on PL 480. So she said that he would be the Consul General with the personal rank of ambassador. And she wrote a letter to Ho Chi Minh, who I find is honored on these words, to Ho Chi Minh saying that I'm sending so and so to you, and he is an ambassador masquerading as a consul general. Now the Vietnamese were fighting a life or death battle in that time. This was the year of our Lord 1968. They had just been through the Tet Offensive. The war was turning in their favor, not because of anything they were doing, but because American students had come out on the campuses in the way in which they are now out of the campuses. And I salute my friend from Syria in favor of the Palestinians. And they were therefore not going to give in to these ridiculous things of an ambassador being posted as a consul general and being asked to give a letter to Ho Chi Minh that would describe him as an ambassador. So the North Vietnamese simply said, you can give your letter to Ho Chi Minh to the head of the Asia desk, but you won't be allowed to meet Ho Chi Minh. And I got posted as his deputy in Hanoi, just at this time, when the Vietnamese were putting this gentleman in his place. So he needed somebody to kick. As they say, if a boss shouts at his deputy, the deputy that shouts at his assistant, the assistant that shouts at the office boy, and the office boy kicks the office cat. So I was in that position that he vented all his spleen on me. And then the crisis came when we were taken on a picnic together with him and his wife, who's a lovely woman, but with whom he was constantly quarreling. And the lady, she was Scottish, and she was full of humor. She was rather well endowed. And so she would say, she would happily say, that when she went into a pub in Scotland, that somebody or the other would call out, here comes Mary bringing in the milk. <laughs> he was, while he was over there, very, very nasty, and always full of anger. And his great hero was B.K. Krishnamana. So he was trying to imitate Krishnamana without having any of the quality, the great quality that Krishnamana had. So on this picnic, Mary offered to give us lunch after an entire day of trekking. And my mother was with me, she was over 50 years old. So she asked him, and he said, no, he didn't want anything. <laughs> and then she asked me, she said, are you hungry? I said, yes. And I particularly think from my mother. So she gave us some biscuits. The next day, this man calls me in and says, how dare you eat my biscuits without my milk? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was 27 years old. I was in this strange, weird country called Vietnam, where we weren't allowed to interact with any locals. So I went out to the Pati Lak, 
which has a large lawn around it, and I sat on the wooden bench and I cried. And thereafter, every time I went to Hanoi, whether it was with the foreign minister or with the prime minister, I would force the entire delegation to go on foot to that wooden bench and pay their obeisance to it. It was my hope that after I became a prominent Indian, the Indian government would take over that bench. And like they have done at Peter Maritzburg, they will make it a national monument. <laughs> Unfortunately, these Japanese who have betrayed us by becoming the best friends of the Americans have demonstrated their friendship for the Americans by dismantling the wooden bench and putting in its place a steel bench, which is not where I cry. <laughs> so we had characters like that as well. The ICS was the complement to these dispossessed princelings, illiterate cavalrymen, and well-connected liquids who joined the service. It was the ICS. Nehru had scathingly said of them during the freedom movement that they were neither Indian, nor civil, nor even a service. And yet he had the wisdom to find that these were opportunistic young men but patriotic government, and that we would need the ICS, not as a steel frame, but as a somewhat rusted iron frame, to be able to build upon with what I regard as a second generation of genuine funds and resources. We were the competition wallahs. And uh, I think we added several dimensions to foreign diplomacy, including economic diplomacy. And I would hope that Kalol will supplement his first recruits with uh, the last recruit and his followers. <laughs> <laughs> that will give a rounded picture of where the foreign service stands. Otherwise, I'll have to leave you with one of my favorite stories of an ICS wife she had, he figures very largely in this book. I know it be good to find out who it was. But his wife was rather homespun. And when they were posted in America, I'm not going to tell you whether they were posted in the embassy in Washington, in the consulate in San Francisco, or in the permanent mission in New York. But when they were posted there, her driver, fell ill, and she being a woman of some compassion, she saw to it that her driver was put into hospital. And when she fetched up to that hospital to inquire after her chauffeur's help, the uh, doctor on duty said, who are you? Are you his uh, wife? And she was infuriated. So she drew herself off to her five foot six inches and said, I'm not his wife. I'm his mistress. <laughs> <laughs> so if Alon is ready to write an irreverential companion volume to this book, I'd be more than happy to collaborate. But for the moment, I must say that uh, the only really delightful memory that this book evoked in me was a prince called Kofta Sangli, whose kingdom was the size of a postage stamp in Saurashtra. He was one of those whom Nehru had recruited, and it was from his Kar Kamal that I received my first passport to go to Cambridge. The others are there, they're here. Some of them are really super people. Many of them or some of them anyway, I wouldn't place in the first category of human beings. But nevertheless, for having introduced the subject, which is otherwise a pretty dead letter, almost as dead as the history of services, and for having highlighted some of the great ones, like Suman Sinha, who was our Consul General in Lhasa, our last Consul General in Lhasa, and our greatest expert on China, and his married 
a foreign service lady whose first choice was the Chinese language. And Nehru, looking at her, said, but won't your mother come after me with a stick and say to me, how have you sent my daughter to Beijing when there are places like London that can be sent to? The Foreign Service has fortunately got out of that rather traditionalist rut in which we were when we started, when brilliant women were simply removed from the service because of the sin they committed in marrying. As soon as they married, they had to be. And they were not allowed to go to what we call a difficult course until one lady, whom I would have been delighted to get married to, except that she was that much older than me, Sivi Gupta. She managed to break this mold and got herself posted to Ghana. But unfortunately for her, as she was stepping out of a Ghana Airlines flight, the uh, ramp had not been properly fixed, and she fell to the ground, and she really had a very difficult time. And so while we had these marvelous women, Sujit Man Singh, whom you haven't mentioned, the eccentric Rukmini Mendel, who I think is well worth a book, even on the chapter, there are others whom we, I think, should pay respects to. There was a dinner party in my house when Vasuki Mukherjee had been invited. And all of them, all the men, were talking about gender discrimination against women. And she stood up and said, I'm from the Foreign Service. I served in it for 36 years. This is, of course, the third generation. She said, I served in it for 36 years, and there was not one minute of discrimination which I suffered. So I think our foreign service has also grown beyond it, apart from being based almost entirely on Nehru, the foreign policy of India, the foreign service has grown beyond the prejudices to which his generation was subject. And today, I'm, when, I, when you look at you can't read the news these days because every front page and now increasingly every inside page has photographs of all those who pass the Foreign Service exam or pass the IAS exam. And I keep looking at the number seven to see uh, who is my spiritual successor. In this batch, it's a lady called Anmol Rapport. And I find that she's far from alone as C.B. Mahatma was in 1948, about half, and I suspect that if I counted carefully, more than half the recruits into the foreign service are now women. They're allowed to get married. They're allowed even to marry foreigners. And the foreign service itself, where men had to retire if they married somebody from abroad. And one of my batchmates, Siva Kumar Das, who shunted out to the UNDP because he married a Czech girl. I think all those bad features of the first of the first generation has now been overcome. And we have a much more genuine good uh, foreign service. I want to end by saying that when the Mandel Commission report was tabled by VP Singh in Parliament, and I had my reservations about it. The same reservations that Nehru had had, Indira Gandhi had had, the Rahul that Rajiv Gandhi was having. Dhawan asked me a question. He said, how many OBCs are in the IFS? I had no idea. But I looked up the same book, The History of Service. It is an annual edition. And tried to identify how many Yadavs there were in the Foreign Service A, there was none. Then I looked at the IFS B, and I couldn't find any others. Now I know that the others are not the only OBC, but it's a, it's a giveaway. So then I looked at the IFS C, and there I found that there were others. So it was clear that up to my generation, 
and even into the 20th century or even into the 21st century. The OBS code, it was an upper class and an upper caste service. It was a service made up of Mokoleki Ola. And now it's becoming more democratic and it has a lot of Hindi speakers. And I was very impressed on a visit that I once made to Istanbul to find that a new recruit could only speak to me in Hindi. But by the time I reached Istanbul again the following year, the same gentleman spoke fluent English and more importantly, fluent Turkish. So we are getting the flavor of our country into the public service. And that, I think, is a very good thing. Thank you very much. We have question and answer session. Those of you who have uh, a question, can you raise your hand and uh, identify yourself and say who the question is uh, meant for? And then, yeah. Suvash? Hold on, hold on. Just take the mic. Brilliant uh, speech like always, Mr. Manish Mukherjee. But I do not understand one of your first sentence, when you said the Chinese alleged invasion of India, was it an alleged invasion or was it an actual invasion? You brought me to a very controversial point. There are various books which indicate that we could have accepted Georgia's proposal. April 1916, we could have perhaps avoided war by backing up our forward policy with adequate military, uh, military strength to be able to open those forward policies. And you will recall that Nehru had said that I ordered the Indian army to throw out the Chinese from the country. And there was a kind of repulse the king of the Chinese. So I used the expression alleged, but I shouldn't have done so. Yes, I shouldn't have done, done so because we are in the middle of the election. No, apart from that, it was historically and actually uh, there was an invasion that was taken over. I agree with you. I agree with you. It was not to be quoted in the last phase of the election. Thank you. Can you have a question for the Yes, I have one question for you. Use the microphone. Yes. Uh, Mr. Bhattacharji, uh, since you have written about the first generation of the foreign service officers, I believe a lot of advice about China given by you know, diplomats, first generation, ignored by the uh, government of the China. I have you written about that since I have not read the book, so I just want to know about that. They have warned about China. They have warned against China, those diplomats. First generation diplomats. Right. I guess, you know, I have uh, written about the fact that, that the structure of foreign policy professionals, even in the mid 1950s, was not really formal. You know, there were lots of, uh, there is a lot of uh, loose, a uh, lot of uh, you know, informality that existed even in the formal structure back at that time. So these uh, communications and you know, they used to get lost and also most importantly our, all our posts in various, uh, various locations were not yet ready. You know, a decade had passed but then uh, the Indian missions were not yet fully manned and in many places the missions were just coming up. And the problem with China was one, very, first of all very unique because it was basically the end of innocence for not just an Hindu you know, administration, but also end up in a sense for the post-colonial state of India, that there were threats um, from nearer home, like you know, you know, not just you know, colonial threats and things like that, but that there were even you know, your compatriots in the Asian Asian continent could also pose security threats. So in that way, these were very new things for the administrators who were at that time on the top positions. 
But I'm sure, you know, as you said, that they have better, they have all any shortcomings in that, right? But you know, if you look at the people who were posted in the mid 1950s and the late 1960s, late 1950s in Beijing, they were first-rate uh, Chinese speakers. They were professionals who came from the finest colleges and the universities. So in that way, you know, at least in the qualitative term, there was no compromise. So there was Sumal Sinha, there was K. M. Kalampili, and G. P. The great G. Parthasarathy was our ambassador right before the conflict broke out. So they were first-rate professionals. So I mean, though the team was very small, and there can be always debate and discussion about whether certain complications were you know, neglected and etc. But I would say that um, though small, they were capable of delivering in difficult circumstances. Uh, good evening, Dr. Kansing, sir. Uh, compliments to your age, almost age of my father, and he always talks about you. I represent the aviation fraternity. I am from the aviation GS Bob. And uh, aviation is dear to us. Dr. Goyal is there. And, sir, I always had a uh, question in my mind. I should want to ask you in person. You had brought aviation and tourism in this uh, part of the world. And today, whatever we are, there are the foundations laid by you. At that time, aviation and tourism used to be together. And we talk that uh, uh, Rahul Gandhi brought something, Rajiv Gandhi brought something. Everybody did something to uh, contribute to the national infrastructure building. What was Nehru's vision about the aviation and tourism? And tourism and aviation having separate later on, do you feel that there is Devala synergy which we are missing? And what was Nehru's vision about aviation and tourism about this country? Are we on that track? Sorry to take you back to the history. Suppose I became aviation minister in 1967, which is three years after the Indian Party. I cannot say what exactly is the vision about aviation. He always talked about the importance of uh, communication. No. He always talked about the importance of uh, being able to uh, go around the world. He was an internationalist in the best sense of that term. And obviously, he was a very careful involved in aviation. But I'm sorry, I cannot actually quote any particular point about uh, aviation uh, for Bunchy. But uh, you're right, aviation was used to be part of, of uh, shipping and, uh, and uh, tourism. Yes. So it was the first time when I joined Mrs. Gandhi's cabinet, shipping and uh, transport were bifurcated. They made a separate ministry under President V. K. R. V. Rao. And tourism and simulation for the first time became a separate ministry under me. <coughs> and I do feel that the the importance of them being together is tremendous. Yeah. You cannot have the one without the other. Yeah. Unfortunately, again and again they've been bifurcated. Right. I'm not quite sure what the position is now. So I know that you can have this in their own minister of aviation. They are two separate brothers. They are two separate uh, So I think it's a, it's a pity because uh, one of the first things was after that I did was I discovered that in, in India had offices around the world, tourism had four offices around the world. Mm -hmm. The first thing to do was to merge the offices, at least use the Air India offices for tourism, which is an obvious thing to do. But as you know, in the government of India, to get two different departments to work with each other, even if they're in the same ministry, is virtually a miracle. It took me two or three years of having it, finding it there. So I agree with you. We should be together, and I hope that whichever government comes to effect next week, we will bring them together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. The book is available at a special rate outside, and Kalor will be very happy to autograph the book. May I now invite the Simran Prabhu to vote us? From all of us here at the Foreign Correspondents Club, a big thank you to Dr. Karan Singh, Kalor, Professor Agarwal, and uh, Mr. Mani Shankaraya for coming here this evening. This has been a wonderful discussion and it has been streamlined live on the FCC Facebook and the uh, normally Twitter, that is the X page. A recording of the discussion will also be available in the archives section of the FCC Facebook page in case anyone wants
wants to go back and listen to the discussion again. And uh, a small request, if anyone is doing a report, please do mention that the interaction took place at the FCC today. Once again, thank you so much from all of us. Thank you. लेखक है उसने बहुत अच्छा लिखा है अपने लिहाज से लेकिन शायद एक और दृष्टिकोण हो सकता है जिसको कि हम कभी कभी सामने रखते हैं लेकिन इसका मतलब नहीं है कि हम किताब का निंदा करते हैं हम उसकी प्रशंसा करते वक्त बताते हैं कि इसी विषय पर और भी तरीके से देखा जा सकता है तो मैं इसी पॉइंट पर आ रहा आप सर कोई हम तो उन्नीसवीं सदी के आदमी हैं ठीक है सर ये जो डिजिटल एज है वो मेरे समझ में नहीं आ रहा सर नमस्कार दो मिनट एक मिनट जरा आपसे मेरे को एक मेमोरी जरूर क्रिएट करनी है सर और आपकी ब्लेसिंग लेनी है आ, आपको मैंने विज्ञान भवन में एक बार सुना था इसी दौर में नहीं विज्ञान भवन में विज्ञान भवन गीता के ऊपर आपने बोला था और इतना बढ़िया था मैसमराइजिंग था दो तीन यार की ऑडियंस थी एंड एवरी वेड गिव स्टैंडिंग ओवेशन और उस 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 संदर्भ में कुछ एक ऐसा बोलिए कि जो आज के संदर्भ में बिल्कुल फिट बैठता हो फ्रॉम दी विजडम ऑफ वेदास क्या बताएं कुछ भी जो आपके आज के दौरान ये तब वित्तीय भूत आना ये सर्वमितम तकम सुकर्मना तम अब वित्तीय सिद्धि नहीं होगी इसका थोड़ा अनुवाद ही हमारे को क्या पता जो भी जहाँ अगर अपने कर्म के माध्यम से आप अधिक कार्य करते हैं तो सिद्धि की ओर हम जाते हैं लेकिन कर्म सारे हर एक चीज कर्म ही है कर्म जो समझ ही है जैसे शिवजी का भक्त हूँ ये तेज कर्म करो उम्मी तत्त्व तक जिन्हें संबोध आवाज़ तो जो कर्म किया जाए इसके चरणों में रखने के लिए वो कर्म आप अपने इष्ट के लिए तो सही रहें अपने इष्ट को फालो करो बहुत बढ़िया सर गोल्डन वर्ड्स हैं आपके थैंक यू सर from the one
correspondent love. Right. I had an opportunity to make sir the president of the FCC club. Sir, I happen to speak to many of our members and everybody is saying that the club has come a big way. It has been upgraded and you have also taken over in a very positive manner. And uh, we were just thinking now some message because uh, we, I, I personally represent the Public Relations Society Delhi as the secretary. Then I also represent the Air Travel Association as the secretary general. This is a network of uh, people who are all we connected. And everybody now is interested that we should expand our network. And sure. You see, we have this auditorium right. we, where we organize at least three to four events every month. Oh, I see. Uh. Inviting people. Right. You know? We had uh, uh. Uh, somebody, a monk, who came and talked about uh, Panchan Lama missing for the last 29 years. Right. And then we had Nirja Chaudhary right. talking about our book, how uh. prime ministers decide. Uh, uh, right. We had Manima Basu okay. who wrote a book about the fall of Kabul. Yes, right. And we have this book. Mm. So we people use this uh. launching their book. Launching exactly. Right. Bill, William Darlimple. Uh. We just done a book uh. called The Golden Road. Okay. Which is going to be released in October. Uh. And I have invited him All right. and he agreed yeah. the book will be launched here. All right.